I once heard a man say that if he could get the answer to just one great question, he'd have all the other religious questions answered that he ever had asked. And the question, of course, was this. Is there a true church in the world today? And if so, how can you locate it? Well, now I'm sure every one of us have thought about that question sometime or other in our lives. Yes, is there a true church in the world and how to locate it? You know, most of the people in North America really belong to a church now. At least in the United States of America, I know about 62 or 63 percent of the people actually belong to some church or other. Now, I think this is the highest in American history. And many of those people go to church every year. Some of them go even twice a year. Some of them, of course, even go more often than that. But nevertheless, with most of those people, it's only a matter of form. In other words, they belong to church all right. And they inherited their religion. Many of those people did. They got it from their father and mother. Or else they met a friend one day who wanted them to come along and be a part of the church. Or else they liked the pastor and it became a kind of social thing with them. This is the way it is with many people. Do you know most people don't even know what their own church teaches? They don't know why they are what they are, religiously speaking. They really don't. In fact, if they did understand what their church really taught, they would not be able to belong to that church because they wouldn't be able to believe it or accept it or subscribe to it. And yet, you know, they are there. They belong. They're sort of like this man I read about in a country store. A, a gentleman was driving through this little town and stopped to pick up something at a little store. And uh, here was this old uh, codger uh, local uh, citizen in there uh, whiling away the, the day. And so he fell in conversation with this man who would stop to pick up some things. And they began to talk about religion. So finally, this stranger, visitor, asked the old-timer here, he said, look, we've been talking a lot about religion, but he said, what do you really believe anyway about religion? Well, he said, you know, I believe just like my church does. And he said, well, what does your church believe? He said, well, they believe just like I do. <laughs> and that's about it. That's what most people know about their own church. Now, friends, the Bible says that we ought to be able to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that's in us. In fact, let's turn and read that now in the Bible in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter 3, 15, here's what it says. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We ought to know why we are what we are, friends. We ought to have a good, solid, biblical reason for belonging to the church that we do so we could explain it from the Word of God. Now, some people think there's a kind of magical power associated with having your name on a church book. In fact, they think you'll be saved if you are favored enough to belong to a church. Now, that's ridiculous, of course. Having your name on that church book is not going to save anybody. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I believe in church membership. I believe you ought to be there. And I'll tell you why. That, it can do certain things for you. It can help you in certain ways. But it won't guarantee you being saved. Number one, what it'll do is to uh, uh, bring you to where you can be taught the Word of God. Because, friends, in a church, you should be taught the meaning of this book, God's Word. Now, if you're not learning this book, and if you're not being taught the Bible in that church, it's not doing you much good to belong, really and truly. Another thing that church membership can do for you is it harnesses you up with other Christians so you can go out there and work for God and do service for him. And these are good things. But if it doesn't do these things for you, then it's just a great big old social club. And it's not helping you really in the long run after all. So uh, what would you do then? How would you find a church? Let, let's just suppose here tonight that somebody in this group wants to find a church to join. How would you go about it? How would you go about it? Uh, would you uh, try to find the one that has the right name? Is there some particular uh, designated title or name that would identify the church for you with the, with the right message and the true doctrine? Well, I don't think that would help much because you could call the church anything, couldn't you? And that wouldn't determine whether it was teaching truth or error, error or anything else. All right, what are you going to do then? Go out maybe to examine the doctrines of all the various denominations and churches? Why, friends, there are hundreds of them, 
and you wouldn't even live long enough to examine all those doctrines. By the time you got a third of the way through, you know, you'd probably be dying of old age because there are literally hundreds of churches and you could never do that. All right, then what are you going to do? How are you going to find that church? Maybe, maybe find the one that has all perfect people in it. All right, and then you'd know you'd have the right one. Is that right? Oh, listen, friends, if you ever found that church and joined it, wouldn't be perfect any longer, would it? And so you sort of have to give that one up too. No, no, you'll never find a church with perfect people in it. The name is not going to tell you whether it's right or wrong. And you'll never have time to study all the doctrines of those churches. Those are the wrong methods, friends. Let me tell you what to do. You go to the book, the Bible, and find out what it says firsthand. Get the truth out of this book, my friends, and then look for the church that teaches according to this word. It won't take you very long to eliminate them, uh, you know, one after another, one after another. They'll drop away by the score when you begin to, care, to compare them with this book, the Bible. Now tonight, we're going to do another very exciting thing. Last night, we introduced the subject of the true church, you remember, and we went to that 12th chapter of Revelation. We compared the two women of prophecy, the scarlet woman of Revelation and the woman in white of Revelation 12. Now tonight, we're going to review again briefly that same chapter, the most wonderful part of the Bible, I believe, because it actually identifies for us the true church for 1984, 85, 86, and right on into the future. So let's come once more and begin the most exciting quest that anyone has ever pursued in the Word of God. Chapter 12 of Revelation. Now remember something, we're, we're talking about a woman in prophecy. God uses women in the Bible to represent His people. Remember that? A pure, virtuous woman represents the true church. A harlot, we found, represents a false and backslidden church. Here is the beautiful bride of Jesus brought forth in chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. God said, I've likened the daughter of Zion unto a comely and delicate woman, Jeremiah 6, 2. Here she is. Here she is. A crown of glory on her head, twelve stars in that crown, representing the twelve apostles. You see, friends, we're plugging in on the history of the church right in the days of Jesus and the apostles. You go all the way back into the Old Testament, you find women back there symbolizing God's people, God's church. In the New Testament, the same way. Here we are now in this great line of faithful people, God's saints, represented by a woman, but we're plugging in right in the days of the apostles because the 12 stars here represent the 12 apostles. Now, let's follow the history of this woman from the days of its beginning right down to our own time and see if we can locate the woman now. That's what we're interested in. We know that the, that the church of the apostles was the right church, don't we? It was a true church. It had pure doctrines. Jesus was there to give it to them. But what has happened in the meantime? Has that church been preserved through the ages so that we can look around right now and, and find it and recognize it? from the Bible description of it. This is what we're going to discover. Let's continue reading now in verse 2. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now we found out who this man-child was, didn't we? Who does this have to be? Jesus is the only man-child ever born who was to rule all nations and who finally was caught up to the throne of God. But now it says the dragon stood there to destroy that child as soon as he was born. Who tried to kill Jesus at his birth? Well, that was Herod, the old Roman king, wasn't it? And uh, God warned Mary in a dream, and they fled with the baby down to Egypt and stayed there till the king was dead. Then they returned and settled in Nazareth where Jesus grew up. Now, folks, that was a master stroke on the part of the devil to try to kill Jesus, wasn't it? Well, that would have destroyed the whole plan of salvation. But he failed. Jesus eluded him. But he still tried. He continued to follow Christ around all of his life, trying to destroy him. 
by any means. And at last he did actually get it into the heart of those uh, Jewish leaders and those Roman soldiers to put him to death. They brought him into that mockery of a trial, you remember, and, and condemned him and crucified it, uh, him and buried him in that tomb. But he burst out of there on the third day, and the Bible says he was taken back to his Father in heaven. Now, when Satan saw that Jesus had finally escaped him altogether, he turned his anger against that little infant church of those days. You see, there were only a few thousand members. And Satan thought, if I can just wipe them out, if I can destroy them, I'll still prevent this message from spreading and frustrate the plan of salvation. And so in verse 13 now, look at this in Revelation 12, verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. You see now, he starts out to, to just wipe out this little embryo church back there with its few thousand members. And I'm telling you, my friends, that was an awful time. Talk about martyrs. Talk about persecution. Those old Caesars of Rome destroyed those Christians by the thousands. It was horrible. Uh, Emperor Severus, I told you the other night, you know, I saw his summer palace, and they said more people had died out there in front of the grandstands before that palace than any other place almost in the world. It was really, really terrible. Most of the apostles died, of course, as martyrs. But now, soon, pagan Rome passed off the stage, and papal Rome came on the scene, and the persecution continued. Even worse, if it could get any worse, they say 50 million people died under those terrible inquisitions of Rome. And that's a most conservative estimate. Read about it now in verse 14. It says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now notice that the persecution builds up and builds up against God's people, against the woman, until finally she has to flee to get away from it. Now, what is the story, the history here that we're talking about? Why, friends, this is talking about those Middle Ages, those early ages, when the Walden Seas and the Huguenots of France and the Aubergenses of the Low Countries. These were these refugee Protestant groups who refused to give up their faith. The pressure built up and built up against them. The persecution became more and more severe until finally they had to actually flee for their lives back into the Alps Mountains. And they hid there in the caves of the earth in order to escape from annihilation from the hands of the persecutors. And so it says here that the woman fled back there and hid out. In the wilderness, it says here. And in history, it was actually back into those alpine valleys and mountains and caves where they could hold on to the true faith. But you know, the armies of Rome marched in there after, after them, pursuing them. And God fought for those people. Avalanches would sometimes come sweeping down and wipe out the pursuing armies. They were protected back in those mountain fastnesses as they held on to the true faith of the gospel, holding the original doctrines, keeping the true Sabbath day, if you please, back there. And uh, they, it, it, these, these people, most of them, were called the Walden Seas. You remember the Walden Seas? They were faithful people. By the way, in North Carolina, not far from where I lived and grew up in North Carolina, there is a, a town called Valdez. V-A-L-D-E-S-E, -E. if you ever drive down Interstate 40 from Asheville going east, you will pass an exit called Valdez. And those people are the descendants of the Walden Seas, and that's where that name comes from. And some of them still have remembrances and strains of the true Sabbath day that was a part of their ancient heritage held on to by these people in the wilderness. Now, they were to remain back there, or rather the woman was to remain back there, it says, for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. How long would that be that the true church would disappear out of sight? Come over to verse 6 now, and it tells us. It says that the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days. Now, there it is. One verse says that she'd go back there a time, times and a half a time. The other verse said she would go back and stay for 1260 days. Now, these periods are equal. They're equal. Well, what does it mean? Well, it simply means that a time in Bible prophecy is a year. Times, plural, is two years. And a half a time is a half a year. And when we add that up, we get three and a half. A time is one, times is two, that makes three, and then a half makes three and a half. 
and three and a half years is equal to 1260 days. So one verse says 1260 days, the other one says time, times, and a half a time. Now, in Bible prophecy, we found out that, that there is a principle of interpretation. In symbolic prophecy, a day stands for a year. Ezekiel 4, 6, God says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. So here is a long prophetic period of time, 1260 days, but really, friends, it's 1260 years. And that is exactly the period of time that, what? We found out that uh, the beast power was going to be ruling the earth. The little horn of Daniel would be exercising his power over the earth for exactly the same period of time, 1260 years. And that extended, you remember, from 538 A.D., and that was the year that Emperor Justinian's decree went into effect, exalting the Pope as the head of all religions on the earth. From that point, 538 A.D., count down 1260 years, it brings you to 1798. Now, friends, during that period of time, the Bible says that the true church was where? In the wilderness. In other words, the true people of God were not in evidence at that time at all. They were in hiding. And the church did not appear before the world until after what year? After 1798, at the end of the 1260 years. Now, let's put this back on our board again this evening. There we are. Now... Let's put up our marks of identification again this evening. We started last night identifying the characteristics of the true church. Now, the first one we have found, the true church would not appear until after the 1260 days or years. We found that period began in 538 A.D. and ended in 1798. So this means, then, the true church could not appear before the world until after what year? After 1798. All right, now we'll leave that there. That's going to be a very important point. We come back again to our prophecy in Revelation 12, and we drop down to verse 17. Now, now, friends, the armies of Rome, I told you, marched in to try to destroy these people, to try to eradicate them. But they were not able to do it. They survived. And later, sometime after 1798, this true message of God, the true church of God, would emerge from her hiding place. Now, what would she look like? The Bible tells us. In fact, in verse 17, it's described very clearly. I consider this verse the most important in the New Testament, maybe aside from John 3, 16. Let's read it now. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here it is. Now, we're going to look at this very close. We'll dissect it again like we did last evening to find out the meaning of every single word in here. And the dragon. Now, who is this dragon primarily? The devil himself. All right, let's call him that. The devil was wroth. What does that word mean? Angry, the old English word for wrath. The devil was angry with the woman. Who is the woman? The true church. And went to make war with a remnant of her seed. And a remnant now. We talked about it last night. What is a remnant? Ladies, go to the remnant sale to buy what? The very last end piece that comes off of a bolt is called the remnant. It's exactly like the first piece that came off but it happens to be at the very end. And it's usually a smaller piece. All right, the remnant of the seed of the woman would be the last part of the true church at the very end of time. Now, this, of course, is obvious from the word itself. Now, folks, what would this last end piece of the true church look like? at the end of time. And you and I are living in that end of time, aren't we? We're now in the time of the end, so we want to know what this verse is saying so we can look around and check up and see if we can identify it. So it goes on and says that he went to make war with a remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God. Now, there's another characteristic. This true people of God will do what? 
They'll keep all the commandments of God. Now, what commandments do you think this would be, friends? Why, this would be the Ten Commandments. Keep all of the Ten Commandments. Now, that may seem like a very strange way to identify the true church. But, I mean, we'll discover in a moment why God says this and why this is going to be a very definitive way to do it. Let's read on now the rest of it, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, there's another mark. What will this people do? They'll have what? The testimony of Jesus Christ. So let's put that down. The testimony of Jesus, whatever that is. Now, uh, we don't recognize that term, do we? That's a phrase that really does not convey any clear meaning to us. Now, what is, what is this testimony of Jesus? Fortunately, the Bible explains it to us. Let's go back to Revelation 19.10 now and get a definition of this term. Revelation 19.10, John sees an angel in front of him. He says, I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. All right, now let's put that up here. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But you say, Brother Joe, I don't know what that means. <laughs> what is the spirit of prophecy? That really is not, is not clarifying the thing any more than it was clear by the testimony of Jesus. Well, now, we're going to get to that in just a moment, friends, and find out exactly what God is saying. We've got three things in front of us now. We pulled them right out of the Bible. I didn't make these things up at all. We lifted them from the Word of God. But now I want to add one more thing before we start looking for the fulfillment of these clues. One more mark of identity. Now tell me, friends, if God has a true last-day warning message to give to the world just before He returns to this earth again, would He give that message to His true church, His true people, to deliver to the world? Does that make sense? Why, of course he would, wouldn't he? In other words, if God has a final word to this planet, to this earth, he would give that message through this woman, his true church, his true people, who would be proclaiming his right message. So the question is, does God have a final message for the world, a warning that must go everywhere just before he comes again? If so, then we would certainly expect this remnant of the woman to be giving that message. Now, let me read you, and I hope you'll turn with me to Matthew 24 and find out about such a message. Revelation 24, 14. That sounds like a familiar text, doesn't it? Listen to this. Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then what? And then shall the end come. What will be the final sign fulfilled before Christ returns? Why, the gospel will go to all the world to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And then Jesus said, the end will come. Listen, John, in the book of Revelation, saw this prediction of Jesus being fulfilled. He saw that message of the gospel going to every part of the earth, and then he saw the end of things take place before his eyes and vision. Come with me to Revelation 14 now, and let's read that. Revelation 14, verse 6. John said, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. Is that what Jesus said would have to happen? Of course it is. And then he goes on to describe the message itself and what it would be saying. Saying with a loud voice, and in the next few verses you have the wording of the very warning itself to all the earth. And then as soon as that message had gone, in verse 14 he says, And I looked, and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. 
And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. The end is coming, in other words. Well, isn't that what our Lord said? This gospel shall go to all the world, and then the end will come. John said, I saw it going to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, he tells what the message is. Then he says, I look, and Jesus was coming with a sickle in his hand to reap the harvest of the earth. So, folks, here is a simple fulfillment of Matthew 24, 14. Now, I submit to you tonight that whatever this message is, that is to go just before our Lord comes, warning the world, it has to be the most important message God has ever sent to this earth. Wouldn't you say that? Why, friends, if it's the last call of God, it has to be urgent. It has to be important beyond our power to even understand it. Now, let's look at that message for a moment and see what it really is. What does it consist of? Well, it tells us, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. Now, notice it doesn't say will come. It is come. Why, it's talking about being in the time of the judgment now. And it says that that kind of a message will go forth to all the earth, saying that we're in the judgment. It has already arrived. It is here now. Have you heard me preaching anything about the hour of God's judgment going on right now? Why, friends, we talked about it last Wednesday night, didn't we? The great judgment day, we found that judgment began in 1844. And we are living right now in the solemn time of investigation. The great high priest in heaven is carrying on this work of the judgment this very moment while we're here. And this is to be a part of what? Of the final warning that God will send to this earth just prior to his return from heaven. Now let's read the rest of the message. And worship him, it says, that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. You know where that phrase comes from? You know where that sentence was lifted from? Right out of the fourth commandment. Those are the words of the fourth commandment, friends. Talking about God as the creator. Why, this is the Sabbath message, friends. The Sabbath is a part of this final call of God. He takes part of that fourth commandment and brings it right over and incorporates it into the last invitation of mercy that goes to this earth, telling them that the judgment is already started and that the Sabbath should be observed, worship God as the creator. And the way to do that, of course, is to honor his sign of creation. Then we go to the next part of it. It says, there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Have you heard us talk about Babylon and who she is and how she fell? And God saying, come out of her, my people? Well, that was last night's message, wasn't it? Why, that mother and her daughters representing the churches, the fallen churches, the apostate churches, those that were committing spiritual adultery by being unfaithful to Christ, the bridegroom. So that is a part then of God's final call, warning people against this system of Babylon, the mother and the daughters, and calling them to separate and come out. And you've heard it right in these meetings. And then we go to verse 9. It says, A third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Have you heard about the beast message in this series, friends? Why, you've heard about the mark of the beast and uh, the number of his name and all the rest of it. Well, this is what should be preached. But not only here. It has to be proclaimed in every nation and country and language of the earth. And I can tell you right now, it's going to practically every place on the face of this earth right now. In fact, it is going out to about 98% of the earth right now, this very moment. In other words, the people... The, the, the percentage of the people who live in the countries, the nations who are hearing this message proclaimed constitute about 98% of the population of the world. So it's all being fulfilled, friends. And God's message warning the world, the very last call of God, would surely be given to His true people to preach. 
his remnant church, the one that was faithful to him, who had been obedient to him, they would surely be the ones he would entrust that final call to preach. And so we can go back to our board here now and put up another point of identification that the, the true remnant church, the true remnant of the woman, would be preaching the message of Revelation 14, uh, 6 through 12. All right, now there it is, friends. And what does this message consist of? The hour of God's judgment is come. All right, it's already taking place. Number two, the Sabbath message. Number three, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people. Number four, the beast message, the mark of the beast. Isn't that interesting, friends? Now we've got four signs here, our, our characteristics that would identify for us the true remnant church. And this message would have to go to all the people of the earth, not to just a few, but to all nations and every language of the earth. Let's look at our list now. We have it in front of us. And we're going to identify it right now. I know some of you will say, as I suggested last night, now Brother Joe's going to say that his church is the remnant church and everybody else is going to be lost. No, no, I don't say that at all, friends. I don't believe that. I said last night that every, there will be people saved and lost in every church, in every church, because everybody will be judged according to the light they have and what they're doing with that light. So there will be people, I'm sure, saved in all churches because they'll be walking in everything that they know and understand. But now, after saying that, God has a remnant church that he's described right here before us tonight. It has all of these characteristics. It would have to arise sometime after 1798 in the world. It would be keeping all the commandments of God, including the Sabbath. And it would have the, the, the spirit of prophecy in it. And it would be preaching a certain message to all the nations of the earth. And that message would include the judgment hour message, the Sabbath message, the fall of Babylon, the call out of Babylon, the beast message, the mark of the beast. Now, friends, how many churches in the world today meet the requirements of this prophecy? Why, you can eliminate them very, very quickly. Go down the list. Most of the great Protestant churches came up long before 1798. Most of them did. And then number two, keeping all the commandments of God. Why, friends, most of the great Protestant churches today don't even claim that they keep all the commandments of God. Number four, for example, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. You go to those churches and ask them, do you keep the seventh day of the week as a Sabbath? They'll say, no, we don't keep it. We don't, we don't uh, 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 teach that man should obey that law of the Sabbath. So number two would eliminate a lot more of the churches. Number three, having the testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy. Now, how many churches really preach prophecy, believe in prophecy, friends? Now, I'm going to show you in just a moment that this spirit of prophecy is much more than just believing in prophecy and preaching it. It really is. But then number four, how many of these churches are preaching the great threefold message of Revelation 14 in all the countries and languages of the earth? My friends, they're not preaching it anywhere. This message is not being preached by very many churches at all. But let's, before we go any further now, let's come back to number three and look at it for a moment. What is the spirit of prophecy? Now, I want you to listen the next few moments, friends, as for eternity, because you're going to learn something that could change your entire life in the next few moments. What is the spirit of prophecy? Now, give me your closest attention. Follow me in your Bible. I want you to look at the verses that I'm looking at, because we don't want to make any mistake about this. When it comes down to the crucial, sensitive business of applying these prophecies and these specifications and discovering the true church, we must know that we're on the right track and that we're making the right identification. So come with me now to Revelation 19.10. Revelation 19.10. Here is where the angel appears to John. 
Are you following me in your Bible? Do you have your Bible open? John says, I fell at his feet to worship him. Now, I suppose any of us would do the same if we saw a glorious angel suddenly come in front of us. It impressed him greatly, almost blinded him, no doubt. And he said unto me, this is the angel now, saying, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, I'm going to quiz you on what I just read you, all right? You all sat there listening. You heard me read it, didn't you? Now, here's my question. According to the words of the angel, who possesses the spirit of prophecy? No, you're wrong. Now, wait a minute. Think about it. Who possesses the spirit of prophecy according to the words of the angel? Wait, did somebody say the brethren? <laughs> All right, you got it right. Now, come back and look at it, folks. Look at it. The angel said, I'm thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. All right, who had the testimony of Jesus? John's brethren had it, right? All right, and then he goes right on to say the testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. Now, my question is this. Who are those brethren of John? Who was it really that did have the spirit of prophecy? Turn over one page to Revelation 22 and look at verse 8 because here the story is repeated again, this whole experience of the angel in John. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets. Now, who were John's brethren? Prophets. And who had the spirit of prophecy? The brethren who were? The prophets. All right. Then, my friends, the spirit of prophecy is not merely the ability to understand prophecy or preach prophecy or else I might say that I had the spirit of prophecy because I understand a little bit of it and I preach a little bit of it. But no, no, the Bible says the spirit of prophecy is possessed only by who? By the prophets. By the prophets. In other words, friends, the spirit of prophecy is the actual ability or gift of being a prophet. That is fascinating, isn't it? Very interesting. In fact, it is the gift of prophecy. See, it calls it the spirit of prophecy, but uh, uh, another word and a better word would be the gift of prophecy because the prophets had the gift, didn't they? Come back with me to 1 Corinthians 1 now. Let's look at something very interesting. 1 Corinthians 1, and I'm reading from verse 5, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, even as what? The what? The testimony of Jesus, the testimony of Christ was confirmed. What is the testimony of Jesus? The spirit of prophecy. All right. Even as the testimony of Christ or the spirit of prophecy is confirmed in you so that ye come behind in no gift. In no gift. You see, here the spirit of prophecy is referred to as a gift. In Revelation, the spirit of prophecy is referred to as the spirit of prophecy. Here it is called the gift of prophecy. Now we're back on familiar ground, aren't we? We're very well acquainted with that term gift. We understand about the spiritual gifts, don't we? In fact, come with me now to Ephesians 4, verse 8, and let's get a list of these special spiritual gifts that were bestowed by Jesus on his people when he went away. Ephesians 4, verse 8, Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high... He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. When Christ went back to heaven, he bestowed certain special abilities upon his church when he went away. He called them gifts. Now, what were those gifts? Come down to verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, there they are. You see, in other words, Jesus gave this man over here the ability to be a, a, a pastor. He laid the gift upon him to perform that, that function, that office. And then he gave someone else the ability of being an evangelist. 
and other, uh, another a teacher, another an apostle. By the way, the word apostle simply means uh, a missionary. It comes from two Greek words, apo, from, stello, to send. So it's somebody who is sent out there to preach or to minister. So that would be, in our terminology today, I'm sure, a missionary. So these are the special abilities that he placed upon men and women in the church when he went back to heaven. Now let me ask you something, friends. What was the purpose of those special gifts that he bestowed upon these people? Look at the next verse. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Well, what does that all mean? Why, to build up the church, is that right? To strengthen and fortify the believers and build up the church. These people were given these gifts to minister to the rest of the followers of Jesus. Now, here's my next question. How long were those special abilities or gifts to remain operating in the church? Read the next verse. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now tell me, when will that be? Well, that'll be when Jesus comes, won't it? In other words, now what he's telling us here is that these gifts were supposed to operate right on down to the very end of time until our Lord comes and receives a perfect church. Now the church will not be perfect until Christ returns. So this means they'll be here right through. Now, folks, let's do something here interesting tonight. Let's look around and see if we can find them. All right? In other words, if God's true remnant church is on the scene today, it will have to be exercising all of these gifts, you see, because the, the gifts were to remain there in the church to the very end. So let's ask a few questions. Uh, what about uh, pastors? Do most churches have pastors today in them? Yes, they do, don't they? All right. Uh, what about teachers? Yes, practically all churches have teachers. Uh, what about evangelists? Yes, yes, that's quite common, isn't it? And what about missionaries? Yes, missionaries are in all the churches, I suppose, practically all of them. All right, what about prophets? <laughs> Oh, immediately our heads begin to shake. Why, how many churches even claim to have the gift of prophets, my friends? That one, strangely enough, seems to have disappeared. It just isn't there among all the others as we look around at the great uh, uh, conglomeration of churches today. And the big question is this, why not? Why not? If Jesus put it in there, in the beginning back there, when he went back to heaven and said it was to remain and the church was perfect, then what happened to this one? That it has apparently disappeared. In fact, back there soon after the days of the apostles, it just seems to have sort of faded away, and then we don't see it anymore. And the question is, why? They did have it in the early church, didn't they? All of the gifts, all of the gifts. Come back with me to Acts 13, and look at this for just a moment. In Acts 13 and verse 1, it says this, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Now there are two gifts, isn't it? Teachers and prophets. And they were in the church at Antioch. Well, this was not uncommon. They had the prophets along with all the other gifts. Now turn to Acts 21 and verse 9 here. Acts 21, 9. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Now notice, this man has four daughters that have the spirit of prophecy. So it was, a, it was a gift among the others, and it was acknowledged, it was recognized. But now the question is this, friend, why did that one disappear? All the other gifts apparently proceeded right on through the centuries, and we can look around today and we see them in practically all the churches. But this one is just not as prevalent as the other. And I'm going to explain why right now. Follow me very closely. Listen. God removed that gift back there in exactly the same way that he'd removed it all through the ages of the past. 
You see, God had a certain way of leading his people and directing his people. Go back in the Old Testament and you'll find over and over again it says that he guided them by his law and by the prophets. The law and the prophets. Have you heard that in the Old Testament? The law and the prophets? Come with me back to Jeremiah. I want you to see this now. Very interesting from the Bible. Jeremiah 26. Jeremiah 20, 26, beginning with verse 4. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If ye will not hearken to me to walk in my law which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye've not hearkened, then will I make this house like Shiloh and make this city a curse. You see, God said you've got to do two things. You must hear my prophets and keep my law. The law and the prophets, those things go together, friends. You can't separate them. The law and the prophets, the law and the prophets. God says you do these two things, and then that will be recognizing my leadership in your lives. Now, friends, as long as the people did this, they were saved. But if they rejected one of these divine means of guidance and direction, God would remove the other one. Now mark this, mark this. If they turned away from his law, he would not guide them by the prophets. In fact, now turn over the page to Ezekiel. A few pages further over now. Ezekiel, well, let's go to Lamentations first of all. Lamentations 2, verse 9. Now this little book follows Jeremiah. I know this because uh, over in India there was a mother that named her little boy Jeremiah Lamentations. I'll never forget that. Lamentations always follows Jeremiah. All right, Lamentations 2.9 says, Her gates are sunk into the ground. He hath destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. The law is no more. Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. You see, they have turned away from the law. And now there's no vision. God does not guide them by a vision anymore because they've rejected his leadership by turning away from his law. Now you'll find this principle all through the Bible. Come on down now a few pages further to Ezekiel 7 and verse 26. Mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest and counsel from the ancients. You see, the two things together, the law and the prophets, and when they reject the law, it says there is no more, there's no more vision for the, for, the, for the prophet. You remember the text over there in Proverbs? It says, where there is no vision... The people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. You see, again, it connects up the visions with the law. And as long as the people are obedient to God and his law, the visions are sent to guide them and give them counsel. But when they turn away from it, God takes away the spirit of prophecy from them. Turn over now to Ezekiel 20. Let's get one more text on this because I want this principle to sink deep in your hearts. Ezekiel 20, verse 3, Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye come to inquire of me? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Now God says, I'm not going to answer you. I will not guide you. Why did he say that? Come on down now. A few verses further, he explains to them. Verse 11 and 12, And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walk not in my statutes. They despise my judgment, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. Then I said I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. You see, God said, I gave you my law. I gave you my Sabbath. You rejected that. You turned away from me. I will not answer you now. I will not guide you now with prophets. Because you see, friends, God considered they were rejecting his leadership when they rejected his law. And therefore, he would no longer be there to counsel. Now, he would send prophets, of course, to, uh, to warn them, to, uh, to tell them uh, what would happen if they didn't turn back. But he would not counsel and guide their steps and direct their ways by prophets as long as they were rejecting his law. Now, with this little background, let's come back there to the book of Acts 
and ask ourselves the question, now why did prophets disappear out of the church along there two or three hundred years after Christ? Do we have any idea, my friends, why that would have happened? What else happened in the church along two or three hundred years after Christ concerning God's law? Why the counterfeit day of the sun was brought in, wasn't it? And the Sabbath of the Lord was set aside and the law was rejected by God's people. And God did exactly what he had always done throughout the history of the past. He took away the guidance of the spirit of prophecy from the church because they had rejected his law. And therefore, my friends, it was gone during those long, dark ages. Now, here's my question. Is there reason to believe that when the church restores the law and the Sabbath to its right place, that God will also reinstate the spirit of prophecy among His people? Is there reason to believe that? Now, come with me to Revelation 12, 17. Let's look at it. Now, here's where the last piece of the puzzle falls into beautiful position. Revelation 12, 17, again now it says, The dragon was wroth with the woman. The devil was angry with the true church and went to make war with the remnant, the last part of the true church in the last days, which keep the commandments of God. There's the law back in its place, isn't it? There is the law restored again. Now what else is God going to restore? Since the law has been put back in place and the Sabbath is being kept again, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is what? The spirit of prophecy. You see, the law and the prophets get back together again in the church of the end time, just like it was in the early church. Isn't that beautiful, friends? In other words, the remnant has to be exactly like the first piece, you know. The remnant is, is really the end of the first piece that came off. And so the remnant church would have to be exactly like the original church. And it would have to have all the gifts in it, just like the early church had. And sure enough, it does. Here it says that it would be keeping all the commandments of God, just like the early church, including the Sabbath, and it would have the gift of prophecy restored to it again. Now let's look at our list up here, friends, and we're going to see something very, very interesting. Take a look again. This remnant would have to arise sometime after the year 1798. We said that uh, most churches do not meet that specification. They came up too early. It would have to be a church that keeps all the commandments of God, including the fourth one, which is the seventh days of Sabbath. So it's got to be a Sabbath-keeping church. It would have to have the spirit of prophecy in it, which is the gift of prophecy. In other words, it would have to have a manifestation of the true gift of prophecy in the church. All right, it would also be preaching a special message to all the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That message would include the judgment message, the Sabbath message, the fall of Babylon, the call out of Babylon, the beast message, the mark of the beast. My friends, there's only one church in the world that meets those four points in front of you tonight, only one. And I please do not misunderstand me tonight. I never make the statement I'm going to make now except in the context of this prophecy. But the only church that meets all those points is the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, that does not mean that all Seventh-day Adventists are going to be saved and other people are going to be lost. In fact, most Seventh-day Adventists may be lost for that matter because it takes more than just a knowledge of truth to save people. They've got to have a personal love relationship with Christ that produces that obedience. So, nevertheless, here you have the marks of identification of the true church, and only one church in the world has all of those marks. This church came up around 1844 and soon afterward, taking its name in 1861. It did come up observing all the commandments of God, in fact, the Sabbath was restored by this church back in those early days. So the law and the Sabbath were restored again. And we believe, my friends, that when that happened, God also restored the true spirit of prophecy to this church through the life and teachings of Mrs. Ellen G. White. 
And I'm going to tell you about that now in just a moment. And then we believe that this message is being, we know this message is being preached tonight in every nation practically under the heaven, the message of the judgment, the Sabbath, the fall of Babylon, the mark of the beast, and so forth. The only church that does it. Now you say, Brother Joe, how do you know that that spirit of prophecy has really been restored to this church? Aren't there a lot of churches that claim to have the true gift of prophecy in it? Of course there are, friends. There are many churches that claim that. In fact, there are many people that come on the scene claiming that they have the true gift of prophecy. For example, near where I live, Jean Dixon claims to be such a, an instrument of God. Her friend Ruth Montgomery wrote a book entitled The Gift of Prophecy in which she claimed for Jean Dixon the special gift of being a prophet. But now, friends, listen. Are there tests in the Bible for true prophets? Yes. The Bible lays down a number of them. To the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. That's one of them found in Isaiah 8.20. In other words, any true prophet would have to speak in perfect harmony with the Bible, right? They really would. By their fruit ye shall know them. The prophecies also would have to come true, wouldn't they? They'd have to be true predictions. Let me quote here something that appeared in the newspaper, an interview with Jean Dixon. And here's what she said in that interview. I personally believe that there is a life after death and that the spirit of a person never dies. It goes on into another body. Mrs. Dixon believes that ghosts are spirits which have not yet found a body to re-inhabit. Ghosts are good, she said. They're there to give people help and understanding. Well, now, that's not according to the Word of God, is it, friends? So we have to say, well, now, that particular gift, uh, claim of spiritual gift, could not be true. I have here a double-page spread of mid-year predictions made by Gene Dixon back in 1974 of August 74. And here are some of the predictions she made. Nixon to stay in. President Nixon will continue to occupy the White House. He'll be found to have committed no impeachable offenses. Well, that one sort of fell through, didn't it? And then, she says here, uh, Patty is betrayed. The betrayal of Patricia Hearst by a female member of the Symbionese Liberation Army will end the long episode in the beginning of legal action against her abductors. Well, that didn't happen either. She was not betrayed by one of those people. And then a woman veep. Now, he was making this concerning Ford, Gerald Ford. Vice President Ford will become a candidate for the presidency in 1976. And then he goes on to say that she would have a, he would have a woman running mate. Well, that didn't happen. Came a few years later that a running mate for another president, but not for uh, Vice President Ford. And then it goes on to say that Wallace, Alabama Governor George Wallace, would leave politics and begin to occupy the pulpit and preach the gospel. That hasn't happened yet either. So really, practically none of those predictions came true. So what can we say, friend? That couldn't be the true gift of prophecy, is it? The true gift is not right 75% of the time or 50% of the time. She claims that 75% of the time she is accurate. But God is more than 75% accurate, isn't he? Yes. Listen, my friends. We believe that this true gift of prophecy was manifested in the life and teachings of Mrs. Ellen G. White. When this message arose... Proclaiming the Sabbath, putting the law back in its right place. We believe God restored that gift to this church. And it meets all the tests of the Bible. We should apply them all to it, friends. All of the tests should be applied. Now, somebody will say, Brother Joe, are you telling me that you've got another Bible? Are you adding to the Scriptures, to the canon of the Bible? Oh, no, friends. We're not adding to the Bible at all. You cannot add. This is a sovereign guide for all Christians, what I'm holding right here in my hand. You cannot add to this or take away from it. The Bible says it will be a curse if you do. Listen, the spirit of prophecy is not an addition to this book. It doesn't add to or take away. What it does, it's like a magnifying glass to bring out the beauty and truth that's here. It is not another Bible. Somebody said, Brother Joe, you, 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 you preaching out of another Bible? No. In all of this meeting, have you heard me preach out of any other book except this? Not any at all, my friends, because this is the sovereign guide. 
But the spirit of prophecy is like a magnifying glass to bring out the beauty and the truth that is in this book. Why did God give it? He gave it for two or three reasons. Number one, in order to verify in the prophecy that this is indeed the true remnant church because he had said that it would have to have that special gift in it. And so he put the gift of prophecy in this church in order to identify it as being the true remnant of the woman. Number two, the truth had been trampled down for all of those 1260 years. And now, at the end time, the last part of that true church is to come forth, emerge, and to begin to do a special work of raising up those doctrines and truths that had been trampled down during those dark ages, and they were to be restored and proclaimed in all the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And in order to do that special work, my friends, that church needed the strength and power and impetus of the spirit of prophecy in it to help it to go forth on that particular mission. And so God restored the gift of prophecy. And I can assure you, my friends, that every book of the 70-odd books that were written from the hands of this young woman meet all of the physical and spiritual test of the Bible, the true gift of prophecy. For example, this young woman only had a third grade education. And yet, I suppose she produced more books that have been published than any other woman author in history. Now, if you can imagine somebody with a third grade education producing a lot of tremendous books that were, that were printed in millions of editions. And every word, my friends, has been in perfect harmony with this book. No contradiction, all in... It would have to be. If it was not, it could not be the true gift because the Spirit of God does not speak in contradiction to itself, does it? It does not do that. Let me give you just an example or two. All of you have a sample of the Spirit of Prophecy right now because you received that book, Desire of Ages, the first week. You received the book, Cosmic Conflict. And that is a, an example. Those are both examples of the Spirit of Prophecy. And those books have been acclaimed, my friends, as masterpieces, masterpieces. And she wrote a lot about diet and health. Let me share something with you in closing this evening. Here is a, an article written by Paul Harvey. You've heard about Paul Harvey, I'm sure, in one of his syndicated columns. He says, once upon a time, a hundred years ago, there lived a young lady named Ellen White. She was frail as a child, completed only grammar school, had no technical training, yet she lived to write scores of articles and many books on the subject of healthful living. Remember, this was in the days when doctors were still bloodletting and performing surgery with unwashed hands. This was in an era of medical ignorance bordering on barbarism. Yet Ellen White wrote with such profound understanding on the subject of nutrition that all but two of the many principles she espoused have been scientifically established. She talked about cholesterol. She didn't call it that, but she talked about the arteries being clogged up with the fat, the animal fat that gets into the system. And that was discovered years and years afterward. In fact, she talked about many things. Let me just briefly refer here to, to a, an article that appeared this past year. In fact, this came out uh, just a few months ago. Can't remember the date. Yes, March 1984 in the Saturday Evening Post. And the author of this article says this concerning Seventh-day Adventists. He says, Long before nutrition achieved the status of a full-fledged science, an extraordinary woman named Ellen G. White was instructing Seventh-day Adventists in the basic concepts of healthful living. It wasn't merely that she denounced the use of alcohol and addictive drugs or that she wrote more than 70 years ago that tobacco is a slow, insidious, but most malignant poison. Many other people suspected as much. More remarkable were her insistence on a well-balanced diet before the phrase was even invented. Her emphasis on natural foods in season whenever possible, long before anyone was aware of the destructive effects of preservation. Her denunciation of meat, especially animal fat, a century before cholesterol and polyunsaturated found their way into dictionaries. And her rejection of refined foods, particularly flour and sugar, before scientists even suspected there were such things as vitamins that could be destroyed in the refining process. And he goes on and on and on, my friends. And these people say she had to be inspired. She never could have written these things. She wrote a book on education. Imagine somebody with a third grade education writing a book on education. 
And later, Dr. Florence Stratemeyer, the head of the education department of uh, New York University, I believe it was, let's see, uh, the professor of education at Teachers College, Columbia University, Columbia University in New York City, she wrote a series of articles describing the principles in that book written by Ellen White over a hundred years before, and she said that those were the soundest and most up-to-date principles of true education that could be found, even though they were written a hundred years earlier by a little lady that had only a third grade education. My friends, all of the spiritual and physical tests are met in the spirit of prophecy. And there is only one church in the whole world that meets those four points in front of you tonight. It was to come up after 1798, keep all the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath, have the testimony of Jesus, which is a spirit of prophecy. It would be preaching a special message to the whole world. And that message would be very specific. The hour of his judgment has come, the Sabbath message, the fall of Babylon, the call out of Babylon, the beast, the mark of the beast. I tell you, isn't that fantastic? When I learned this truth, I knew that I had to go out and spend the rest of my life preaching it because God actually went down the line, one, two, three, four, identifying that church today. And my friends, it was the happiest discovery of my life when I found it. And I hope tonight you feel the same way. And if you haven't yet become a part of it, I want to invite you to do so. If you've had any questions or doubts about it up until now, I trust that those doubts have been taken away this evening because no one can, can uh, uh, answer these tremendous truths or deny these tremendous truths that we have placed on the board before you. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a story I heard about one of our missionaries down in the high Andes mountains who was going from village to village there proclaiming the gospel. He came to one place and spent several days with the people. They wanted him to stay longer, but he said, no, I must go to other villages. They said, well, will you send us a teacher to tell us more? He said, there's no money, but as soon as there is money, I promise to send a teacher. They said, how will we know that you've sent him? And the missionary bent down and picked up a stone and broke it in two. He gave them half of the stone. He took the other half. He said, the teacher that I send will bring the other half of the stone. And he left them. Two years later, they were able to send a teacher. And he came to the village, and they rushed out to meet him with their half of the stone. And he had the other half, and they fitted it together, and it matched perfectly. And that mission became known as the Broken Stone Mission. My friends, God has given us half of the stone, hasn't he? And we've matched it up tonight. And we've found the true remnant church for these days. If you have not made your decision to be a part of it, I want to ask you to do it tonight. Here's what I'd like for you to do. If you're not a part of this true remnant church, while I'm offering the closing prayer this evening, would you just reach out and make a big cross on the front of your card? If you've been waiting or holding back for any reason, surely tonight you can't wait any longer. You can't hold back now. As you see how God has identified so specifically in one, two, three, four points, surely now you're ready to say, Brother Joe, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. This is what God has been preparing, preparing me for, to be a part of this message. I want to go out there and spread this same message because Jesus will come when this message has gone to all the world. My friends, we need your help to, to, to tell it everywhere. It's got to be proclaimed, and then the end will come.